Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the Gordon Snellgrove Gallery foyer. Uh, today on Treaty 6 territory, we're going to be celebrating the launch of the new moon. But I want to acknowledge, first of all, where we are. Here on Treaty 6, it is the homelands of the Nehiyao, the Dene, the Nakota, Lakota, the Anishinaabe, the Soto, and it's the, home, the ancestral homelands of the Métis people. As I said, we're launching the new moon, the frog moon. And when I say new, I don't mean it's new today. I mean that it's the next in our uh, incredible constellation of the 13 moons that make up the lunar calendar uh, used by so many of the indigenous people of this land. So today we're going to be joined by uh, Sandy Bonney, who will introduce you to our guest speaker for the day. I want to uh, acknowledge again the pe people that have been participating in this project. Uh, so we began with uh, Vanessa Hagen and Sandy Bonney, and then brought in uh, Lyndon Tutusis, and then many members of our community to surround this project with uh, information and care. And as it lays out each moon, uh, one by one, we're transforming this space and getting ready for you to join us again, hopefully in the new academic season. But if not, we're bringing you greetings uh, here in the ether, and we look forward to seeing you soon. Thank you. So we will come this month as we say farewell to March. We want to get rid of all the negative things and all the stuff that's making us ill mentally, physically, emotionally, and spiritually. And uh, we, as the elder says, it's another month, another month to be thankful for. Now we, we uh, welcome the eagle moon. Other tribes call it differently, but we call it Eagle Moon in Northern Saskatchewan. So that's what we're welcoming now for new things, because you know that spring brings new birds, new flowers, trees budding, like everything is becoming new. As well, we should be the ones doing our thing as well, to clear our minds and especially the emotions, the emotions that we've stored up all winter and because of COVID that we cannot gather together. You know, it's very difficult for everybody. But as we smudged this morning down by the river, we offer tobacco and the prayers for everyone, especially for ourselves, that we struggle every day and yet we're trying to help others. So we need that prayer as well. And we do it for our families, all our families, our children, our grandchildren and everybody, that they be well. So when the elder says, it's something new now and we need to go ahead with a, 
with a positive attitude and uh, rest all our fears and our burden to the Creator because only today is only loan to us and we need to uh, to see that through. And I want to thank Elder for for saying uh, the good things in Cree about the evil. Because in today, my last comment now, I hi. Hi, my name is Sandy Bonnie, and I work as team lead for Indigenous Student Achievement Pathways in the College of Arts and Science, and I'm excited to in introduce our uh, guest speaker. Um, this project has a, a name overall, and that name is Anuch Kipasikonau, We Rise, Nipawi, which is in Cree, English, and Michif. Um, we've used the Plains Cree names for the moons, and this moon is Ayikawipisim, or the frog moon. It's a, a name for a moon usually associated with the month of April, um, but of course it, that depends on the uh, the warmth of the season. So this is the, the lunar cycle when the frogs usually wake up. Um, in swamps, they actually thaw out, they've been frozen all winter, and they begin calling out to one another. If there was a uh, a gopher moon, it's also the gopher moon. So I've seen those little people running around Saskatoon already. So the faculty member who is going to share a message with us today is Dr. Colin Sprout. Colin is a Métis assistant professor in the Department of Geological Sciences, and he joined the University of Saskatchewan in 2018 after finishing his PhD at Western University and doing a postdoctoral fellowship in Nanjing, China. He's a paleontologist and his uh, area of strongest interest is 450 million year old brachiopods, which are a type of bivalve similar to a clam um, that's rather uncommon in the oceans today, but was very common before the time of the dinosaurs. So in fact, uh, brachiopods were very abundant in the Iapetus ocean, whose closure about 450 million years ago drove metamorphism of marine shales to produce these beautiful slate stones. And so this happened, a uh, little shout out to students in my geology class this term, this happened when uh, the Taconic orogeny caused closure between the proto-continents of Laurentia, Siberia, and Baltica, and marked the beginning of a 200 million year convergent tectonic event that saw the creation of the supercontinent Pangaea. And Pangaea formed um, with all of the, most of the areas of continental crust on the earth forming one landmass. And right around that time, there was a, a large extinction uh, about 250 million years ago that saw many of the brachiopods go extinct. So there are still some brachiopods today, um, but they're found in Arctic refuge waters. So they're unlikely that you'll find them on a beach and much more likely that you'll find them in Colin's lab. Hello, I am Colin Sprout. I'm a Métis professor in the Department of Geological Sciences um, here at the University of Saskatchewan. Um, when Sandy and Michaela were first trying to recruit people for this project, I was very hesitant to get involved uh, because I, I'm really not much of an inspirational speaker, uh, but I thought about it a little longer and I thought maybe the way I could contribute to this um, would be telling my story as a, an Indigenous um, student from rural Manitoba, um, how I made my way through the university system and, and how I started my academic career. Maybe that would be useful for some of you students watching. Um, so before we get too far, I study something called fossil brachiopods. Um, I'm a, a paleontologist, um, so if you've never seen a brachiopod, this is what they look like. Hopefully that's at least partially in focus. Um, so they're, they're tiny little shellfish. They have two shells that, that close like that. Um, some of them are that size. Um, some of them are much larger and rounder. Um, this is a, a nice paperweight I have on my desk. And some of them can be really tiny as well. I don't know if you can see those at all, but they're, they're tiny little shells that are about the size of a grain of sand. It's all different shapes and sizes. Um, they're not very common in the oceans today, but 450 million years ago, in a, a time we call the Ordovician period in geology, um, when Saskatchewan was underneath a, a shallow uh, continental sea, um, they were probably one of the most common seashells out there. Um, so they can tell us a lot about how the ecosystem was changing at that time, 
um, during a time of, of changing sea levels. Um, and I don't know, I just find it really interesting. Um, so as a, a kid growing up in rural Manitoba, um, I spent a lot of time outside and I always enjoyed being outside, um, you know, hiking through the bushes. And um, so when I got to university and I had to decide what I wanted to do, um, I didn't really know. I was always interested in science. Um, but I also didn't really like the idea of being stuck in a lab all day. Um, so I decided to start out in biology, and like you do here, um, I had to take my uh, first year you know, prerequisites and, and a few electives to fill out my humanities and, and sociology requirement. Um, so as part of that, I, I had a, a gap in my schedule. Um, so I went to see an advisor and she suggested, well, why don't you give geology a try? I said, well, I don't even know what geology is. Um, and she said, well, you know, when I was going through university, I took a geology course and, and it was something that I really enjoyed. Um, and I didn't end up sticking with geology, but it was, it was one of my favorite classes that I took. I said, oh, okay, I'll give it a try. So I signed on for first year geology. Um, and then I signed on for the, the second term of first year geology. And then five years later, I came away with a, a geology honors degree. Um, so obviously I enjoyed it. Um, I stuck with, with biology though. I ended up doing a minor in biology, um, which maybe explains why I'm a paleontologist today, combining the study of, of rocks with living things. Um, but one of the, the key experiences during my undergrad was when I was offered the opportunity to work for a summer as a research assistant. And I mean, I didn't come from a wealthy family. I had to pay my own way through school, through working, um, through the week, in the evenings after class, um, and working in the summers and, and taking out a loan. Um, so I thought, yeah, why not? You'll pay the bills and it's something I haven't tried before. And so I went out in the field and we collected some brachiopod fossils. Um, and then we came back and I spent the rest of the summer studying the fossils and, and preparing them and taking photos of them and, and whatnot. Um, and I really, really enjoyed it actually. And then I ended up doing it for another summer. And then the summer after that, my supervisor didn't have the money to take me on. Um, so I ended up uh, working with a, another prof as a research assistant studying fossil plants. Um, I didn't end up sticking with fossil plants. I came back to fossil brachiopods actually, but um, that was a fun experience as well in its own way. So I enjoyed being a research assistant and I thought, well, maybe I can make a career of this research thing. Um, so the next step on that career is to get a master's degree. And I'd never really been outside Manitoba, um, but it was suggested by my undergraduate um, supervisor at the time. Um, well, he, he knew this guy working at, at Western University in London, Ontario, that also works on fossil brachiopods, and suggested that I, I contact him um, to see if he had any openings for graduate students. And he did. Um, so I went over there, I did my master's on brachiopods and stuck around and did a PhD. Um, so I was in London for six years. Um, and then following that, I had the opportunity to take up a postdoctoral fellowship um, halfway around the world in Nanjing, China, um, which was a, an incredible experience in so many ways. Um, it was, I mean, it was a, a great experience in terms of my, my professional life, um, but maybe arguably even more important, it was a, an amazing personal experience. Um, so as somebody that grew up in rural Manitoba and had never really left the country um, other than to go to the U.S. once in a while, um, it was really, it was interesting and very challenging um, to live in a culture that is basically the exact opposite of one's own. Um, so it gave me a, a, a whole new perspective on students that actually you know, are, are pulled out of their culture um, and are, are forced to, to study in a place that feels foreign to them. Um, so a year and a half into that, um, I applied, I was applying for jobs all over the place, 
Um, but I applied for a job at the University of Saskatchewan um, and they called me up for an interview. I came here actually in the middle of February, which was not very pleasant coming from a place like Nanjing, China, that, you know, the coldest in winter it gets is about you know, zero degrees on a very, very cold day. Um, and I think it was like minus 20 when I came here. Um, but I liked it. I liked the department. They liked me. Um, and so they offered me a position and I came back the following fall um, to start my career um, back home on the prairies, which was kind of nice. And I've been here ever since um, and really enjoy my job. Um, so I guess if I can leave you with kind of a, a one take home message out of all of this, it's don't be afraid to try new things. Um, there are so many students that, that come into the university saying, you know, I want to be a doctor or I want to be you know, an engineer or a lawyer or whatever it is. Um, but they don't take the opportunity to, to try new things. And some of them get partway through their program and they get really frustrated because they're not enjoying what they're doing anymore. Um, and I think it's important to try to have a, a diverse experience um, through your undergrad. Um, so don't be afraid to try new things and also don't be afraid to take chances. Um, because if I, if I didn't take a chance on that geology course and then didn't take a chance um, on that research assistant position and then didn't take a chance on going halfway around the world to Nanjing, China, um, there's a, there's a good possibility that I never would have ended up here. Um, and I probably would have ended up somewhere else and maybe I would have been happy doing whatever I would have been doing. Um, but I would encourage you to, to tr not be afraid to try new things um, and, and never give up on your academic journey either. Um, you, I can't guarantee that everything will go absolutely smoothly for you at university. Um, but going through what you will go through will end up making you a stronger person in the end. And yeah, if you're ever in the geology building or ever in the neighborhood of the geology building once the pandemic is over, because nobody is, is on campus, um, it's actually nice and quiet. <laughs> um, don't be afraid to stop by my office. I'm always happy to talk to people about what I do. Um, it's my passion. I really enjoy it. Um, and maybe I can inspire you to take that first year geology course too.